This is Space Time, Series 24, Episode 99. Coming up on Space Time. A weather satellite destroyed by space junk. More delays pushing the next test flight of the Starliner to next year. And a new study says warp drive will remain science fiction. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. It now looks like space junk from a 1996 Russian rocket may be behind the destruction of China's Yunhai-102 weather satellite earlier this year. The United States Space Force's 18th Space Control Squadron detected the meteorological satellite suddenly break apart into 20 major pieces back in March. But the cause has been a mystery. Until now. Jonathan McDowell, a scientist with the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics in Massachusetts, examined the incident in detail, concluding that the breakup was caused by a collision between the Chinese weather satellite and debris from a 1996 Russian rocket. The Zenit 2 rocket had been used to launch the Teslina spy satellite in 1996. Shortly after payload deployment, however, the Zenit began to break apart. Between 1997 and 2021, at least eight debris objects were tracked from the Zenit 2. McDowell says his analysis shows that the Yunhai-102 and debris from the Zenit 2 pass within a kilometre of each other at exactly the same time as the Chinese spacecraft suddenly began to break apart. Some 37 debris objects have been detected from the collision so far. Current estimates suggest there are some 200 million bits of space junk a few centimetres in size or less currently orbiting the Earth. And although small, this debris is all travelling at around 28,000 kilometres per second. The big fear is what's known as a cascade event, where satellites spent rocket stages or bits of space junk slam into each other. The concern is that ultimately the Earth could face a Kessler syndrome. First proposed by NASA's scientist Donald Kessler back in 1978, the Kessler syndrome involves a runaway chain reaction of collisions, exponentially increasing the amount of debris clouds orbiting the Earth until it reaches an ultimate point where the distribution of debris could render space activities and the use of satellites in specific orbital ranges impractical for generations. A Kessler syndrome isn't that far-fetched. The International Space Station is regularly forced to change orbit to avoid space junk, with crews often needing to seek refuge in dock capsules in the event of a major collision and the need to undertake an emergency escape back to Earth. In fact, just a few months ago, a piece of space junk smashed a hole in the space station's robotic arm. Luckily, nothing penetrating the inner hull yet. Returning spacecraft often show evidence of debris impact caused while in orbit. The first major recorded satellite collision occurred back on February 10th in 2009 when the 560-kilogram Iridium-33 telecommunications satellite collided with the deactivated 950-kilogram Russian Cosmos-2251 satellite. That collision occurred 800 kilometres over northern Siberia at a relative speed of 11.7 kilometres per second. That's some 42,120 kilometres an hour. Both spacecraft were destroyed, leaving a cloud containing literally millions of pieces of debris and shrapnel. The destruction of China's Yunhai-102 weather satellite shows just how serious the problem now is. This is space time. Still to come, more delays push Starliner's launch date till next year, and a new study says warp drive looks likely to remain the stuff of science fiction. All that and more still to come on Space Time. The long-awaited orbital test flight of Boeing's new CST-100 Starliner to the International Space Station looks like being delayed until at least next year, following discovery of critical technical issues with the spacecraft as it was sitting on the launch pad waiting to blast off. 
The issues are so severe, Boeing was forced to roll the Starliner and its Atlas V launch vehicle back into Space Launch Complex 41's vertical integration facility, where the spacecraft was removed from the launcher for major repairs. The long-awaited unmanned orbital test flight 2 was slated to take place on July 30th, but it was moved to August 3rd following problems with the space station's new Russian Nauka science module, which suddenly ignited its thrusters following a software issue, sending the orbiting outpost spinning out of alignment. However, as Starliner was fueled and waiting to blast off, mission managers detected an unexpected valve position indicator in the spacecraft's propulsion system during checkouts. Boeing thinks rain somehow infiltrated 13 valves in the Starliner propulsion system. They think that moisture combined with the corrosive hydrazine fuel to damage the seals and prevent the valves from opening correctly as required before the August 3rd launch attempt. Technicians were able to replace nine of the valves in situ, but the remaining four are located deep inside the spacecraft and require more evasive work. It's the latest in a series of issues affecting Boeing's Starliner, in stark contrast to SpaceX's Dragon, the other company contracted by NASA under their commercial crew program to transport astronauts to and from the space station. In fact, SpaceX has already flown 10 astronauts to the orbiting outpost in just over a year. The company has four more crew members slated to launch next month. And they're even looking at launching four space tourists into orbit aboard a Dragon sometime this month. The second Starliner orbital test flights needed after the first flight failed to reach the space station back in December 2019. The problem back then was software issues. Firstly, there was a faulty mission clock which placed the spacecraft into the wrong orbit without enough fuel to reach the space station. And then just prior to its deorbit burn to return to Earth, mission managers discovered more software issues. And these would have been far more catastrophic, sending the spacecraft crashing into its own service module during separation, a manoeuvre which would have undoubtedly have destroyed the capsule. Luckily, that problem was caught in time and the spacecraft made it safely back to the ground. NASA later identified 80 corrective actions Boeing needed to undertake before another test flight. When it does take place, the unmanned test flight will carry supplies to the orbiting outpost. It will undertake an automated docking, later undertake an automated undocking and re-entry to Earth, landing at the White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico five days after launch. Boeing were hoping to have their first manned crews fly to the space station before the end of the year, but that now looks like not happening before late next year. This is space time. Still to come, a new study says warp drive will remain science fiction, and Vega carries out its second launch of the year, placing a new Pleiades Neo 4 Earth observation satellite into orbit. All that and much more still to come on space time. The idea of faster-than-light travel has been a key feature of science fiction for decades. In fact, it's a given, needed to make most sci-fi stories work. After all, without warp drive, the likes of Kirk and Picard could not boldly go where no one has ever gone before. Engage. In fact, the Enterprise would have taken four and a half years just to reach Alpha Centauri, probably to find the Jupiter 2 already waiting there. Oh, the pain. The pain. The idea of warp drive involves generating some sort of a warp field that compresses the fabric of space time in front of you and expands it behind you, moving you forward. So, technically, it's the space time around you that's doing the moving. In that way, you're not really traveling faster than the speed of light. At least, I'm sure that's the way Zephyrin Cochran would have explained it. Inspired by the world of Star Trek, Some scientists have taken a serious look at the sort of physics that will be needed to achieve warp drive in reality. And in 1994, theoretical physicist Miguel Alcubierre suggested that it was mathematically possible within the laws of general relativity. He hypothesized that general relativity would allow for what he termed warp bubbles, regions where matter and energy were arranged so as to bend space-time in front of the bubble and expand it behind. 
that would result in a flat area inside the bubble for faster than light travel. The problem is, his hypotheses do contain some insurmountable problems. Firstly, there's the issue of time dilation. See, time slows down the faster your velocity. So, even if you could reach the planet Vulcan to visit Spock in a single human lifetime, by the time you got back to Earth, everyone you knew would be long gone. Then there's the issue of energy, with estimates suggesting that a working warp drive would require almost the entire energy budget of the known universe far more than all the dilithium on Bajor, or even in the spice mines of Arrakis and Kessel combined. And of course, there's still the pesky problem of breaking that speed of light barrier. To find out more, Andrew Dunkley is speaking with astronomer Professor Fred Watson. There will be no warp drive. It's impossible. Why? Why, Fred? Yeah, well, it apparently doesn't work. Um, So... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's it in a nutshell. Um, the story it goes back to 1994 to a physicist called Miguel Alcubier, who essentially formulated what how you could build a warp drive. Um, it, you know, it, building on the, the of course the warp drive that Star Trek used two decades yeah. before uh, the um, the warp drive could be a reality. There was a hypothetical way that used modern physics to demonstrate this twisting of space that lets you avoid the universe's speed limit so that the speed limit, of course, says that you can only move through space at uh, the speed of light. That's the maximum. Yeah. But warp drives uh, like the Alcubierre one, uh, if I'm pr- pronouncing that correctly, seek to bend the fabric of space, if I can put it that way. So, mm. and it actually got a lot of attention. A lot of um, quite serious institutions looked at this, but the calculations quickly turned out that the problem with it was that you needed more than the entire energy budget of the universe to make it work. And that sort of dampened enthusiasm down a bit. But there's been some new research. These are two physicists based in the USA, Alexei Bobrik and Gianni Martire, if I'm pronouncing the names correctly. They've looked at the warp drive again and they've kind of uh, worked out that even if you could make one it may not allow you to travel faster than light it may not bend reality in the in the way you want it to and so that's been a dampener but they've actually the details of this story are that technology that you might use if you could bend space could have other it could have other applications some of which are quite intriguing oh, okay. um, i don't really want to go into the details because it's I find this sort of stuff very hard to describe. But one of the uh, proponents has sort of drawn an, an analogy here. There's an analogy of saying that a warp drive is a bit like a car, uh, because what you do is you bend space around it. You bend, you twist space in front of it, sort of crush it all up and spread it out behind it. That's the idea. All right. And so um, that's that's the theory of the warp drive that you and it's why people have thought that you could you, you could shortcut the distance because you've compressed the space in front of you and the opposite side is stretching it behind you. So compressing the space theoretically, at least that was the idea, would let you cross that space quicker, and so you exceed the speed of light. But the analogy that's been drawn is, as I said, a bit like a car, because it turns out that just like a car, which is a shell of material, what you do with the warp drive is you build a shell of warped space around yourself, and the space in in the middle is okay. It's what we call flat space. It's kind of like the space that we're all sitting in now. Um, But you've built this shell around you of the warped space, but it doesn't actually get you anywhere because the whole thing still moves at no faster than the speed of light. Um, so that's the bottom line that they've, you know, that they've um, they've uncovered. It, however, does suggest. Uh, I mean, the, the, sorry, the, just going back a bit. There, there were other key issues with the Alcubier device because it needs negative energy, which doesn't exist at the moment. That was one of the pitfalls with it. Even if you could find it, though, it turns out that it doesn't really work. But but what they've suggested is what these uh, new authors, uh, Bobrick and Martiri, have suggested is that because you're using the space warping to modify the region 
of the bit of space that you're in. Because what you're doing is you're kind of building a wall around a piece of flat space time, a piece of normal space time. You can use the other aspects of relativity, like time dilation. You can speed up or slow down time within the warp drive. So, well, there's some examples that have been... This is a Cosmos article I'm reading here that actually comes from the conversation, so it's uh, freely available. But the author of this has suggested if you had somebody with a terminal illness and you thought that they could be cured in a few years, you put them inside a warp drive and you slow the clock down. And then they sort of stay ill for a short time, but that few years or those number of years that they need for the new cure, that passes normally outside the warp drive. And that's the sort of thing that they're talking about. You could you could do the alternative thing. Here's a suggestion from the same article. Want to grow your crops overnight? Stick them in a warp drive and speed the clock up. A few days will pass for you and a few weeks will pass for your seedlings. Yeah, it's an interesting thought. Still it's amazing. Still very much in the realm of theoretical physics, but some very nice ideas for this um, possibility. And I should credit the author of the uh, conversation article, that's Sam Barron of the Australian Catholic University, somebody whose name crops up quite a lot in these sorts of considerations, writes very well about these really quite difficult issues. I suppose the big problem is even if we come up with a workable theory, the energy you need to create the the possibility is, is beyond us. Um, which prompts the question, what can we do at the moment? I know you and I have spoken about various forms of propulsion using laser to to send miniature spacecraft to other stars, Um, but it sounds like travel to the stars in short time um, through through warp drives is not going to happen. But um, uh, there was another, uh, I, I think, discussion we had about the potential for nuclear power. Uh, yeah. in terms of space travel. Uh, that would get you going. <laughs> <laughs> it would. Um, it does get you going. Uh, and so that's a, probably a viable alternative to to the light sails that you you just mentioned, using lasers to blast mm. you along with a light sail. But, of course, these are still all limited to the speed of light. So even if you're going at 99.9995% of the speed of light or whatever, it's still going to take you four and a half years to get to the nearest star. Mm. Um, and if you're going, actually, if you're going fast enough, the time dilation effect comes into play. Your four and a half years trip as seen from Earth becomes just a couple of years for you or perhaps six months or something like that. It's really interesting yeah. stuff. Oh, it's... Yeah, it's, it's it makes your head spin, but uh, it's yeah, it brings back that uh, that that twin theory about the um, yes, um, the twins the paradox. One that stayed on the planet, and one that did a, a trip and came back and hadn't aged, where his uh, where his brother was fifty years older or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it, it yeah. It actually, in theory, is is a real possibility, isn't it? Well, so. it's more than a theory. That that actually works. We know that from mm. the behaviour of subatomic particles when they get near the speed of light, time slows down for them. So, yeah, yeah, we see that uh, see that happening. But sadly, for all the Star Trek fans, um, there's no warp drive. Never, probably, will be. We're going to have to find something else. Uh, maybe if they get out there with some horticulturalists, they can find some wor- wormholes. Wormholes are what you need, that's right. <laughs> that's that's probably the, the solution. Mm. But not right. horticultural ones. That's Professor Fred Watson, an astronomer with the Department of Science, speaking with Andrew Dunkley on our sister program, Space Nuts. And this is Space Time, still to come. Vega launches the Pleiades Neo 4 Earth observation satellite into orbit. And later in the science report... A new study warns that extreme El Nino and La Nina events will become more common as global warming increases. All that and more still to come on Space Time. A Vega rocket has blasted off from the European Space Agency's Kourou spaceport in French Guiana, carrying the new Pleiades Neo 4 Earth observation satellite into orbit. What a sight. They are off. 
Vega streaking across the night sky, lighting up the skies over the spaceport, over the Amazon rainforest. Our passengers have started their journey. Playad Neo, Bro4, Sunstorm, Leadsat and Radcube are on their way. It's a huge moment for everybody who's involved. It must be quite something watching your babies lift off from the pad. We have confirmation there of separation of the P80 and the Z23 has switched its engine on. Trajectory is nominal. We're climbing, look at the altitude, 127 kilometers and climbing. And we have separation there of the Z23 and beginning of the roll motion. Switch to the engine on of the Z9, the Z9 engine, and we have separated the fairing. It was the second Vega launch this year, placing the high resolution remote sensing satellite into a 625 kilometer high polar orbit. The 922-kilogram Pleiades Neo 4 is the second of four spacecraft for a new Earth observation constellation being developed by Airbus. The first was placed in orbit in April, also aboard a Vega rocket. The Pleiades Neo satellites are designed to produce optical imagery with resolution down to just 30 centimetres. As well as the primary payload, this mission also carried four small CubeSats, each no bigger than a breadbasket. One will be part of a new French constellation being developed to monitor maritime traffic, and the other three are European Space Agency scientific and technology demonstration CubeSats. The mission was the 19th Vega launch since the rocket's first flight in 2012, and the second since a catastrophic failure in November last year, when one of the upper stages failed during ascent. This is Space Time. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. A new study warns that close contacts were at highest risk of catching COVID-19 if they had contact with the infected person between two and three days from when the index patient first showed symptoms. The findings reported in the Journal of the American Medical Association are based on a study of 8,852 contacts of 730 index cases and were carried out between January and August 2020. The authors found when the index case didn't have any symptoms, close contacts were less likely to catch COVID-19. And if they did, they were less likely to have symptoms themselves. The study suggests that the severity of the index case may be linked with the likelihood and severity of illnesses for close contact. According to the World Health Organization, more than 8 million people have now been killed by the COVID-19 coronavirus, with some 4.5 million confirmed fatalities and more than 215 million people infected since the deadly disease was first spread from Wuhan, China. A new study warns that extreme El Nino and La Nina events will become more commonplace in the future because of the worsening climate change situation due to increases in greenhouse gas emissions. The findings reported in the journal Nature suggest that extreme El Nino and La Nina events are projected to increase from the present 5.6 events per century up to 8.9 El Nino and 8.3 La Nina events per century respectively in future climate scenarios. The El Nino Southern Oscillation Pattern is the strongest driver influencing Australia's weather and climate on a year-to-year -year basis. El Niño, or little boy in Spanish, is associated with extended periods of warming sea surface temperatures in the central and eastern tropical Pacific. The name comes from Peruvian fishers back in the 1600s. They noticed reduced catches of anchovies during periods of unusually warm water in the Pacific Ocean. Its counterpart, La Niña, or little girl, is associated with extended periods of cooling sea surface temperatures in the central and eastern tropical Pacific. The Southern Oscillation is the accompanying atmospheric component linked to the change in sea temperature, with El Niño causing high surface pressure in the tropical Western Pacific and La Niña low pressure. These cycles loosely operate over timescales of between one and eight years. 
El Niños tend to result in periods of warmer temperatures, reduced rainfall, drought and increased fire danger in Australia, while the Americas tend to experience increased rainfall, flooding and storm activity. A new study has identified 26 species of Australian frogs at greatest risk of extinction, with four likely already gone. The findings, reported in the journal Pacific Conservation Biology, warn that Queensland's northern gastric brooding frog, mountain mist frog and northern tinker frog, as well as the yellow-spotted tree frog from the Australian Alps, have most likely already gone extinct. The research by the National Environment Science Program also warns that the southern corroboree frog and baobab frog from the Australian Alps and the croombit tinker frog and arbid mist frog from Queensland are likely to become extinct by 2040 unless there's effective new action to try and save them. The authors also warn another five species of frog, including the beautiful nursery frog and croombit tree frog, are at moderate risk of extinction by 2040. Scientists say the biggest threats are posed by amphibian fungal disease, chytridomyces, climate change and habitat loss, followed by invasive fish and pigs. Paleontologists have identified two new species of giant seropod dinosaurs discovered at a dig site in northwestern China. Seropods are herbivorous or plant-eating dinosaurs, with elephant-like bodies and legs, a long neck and small head at one end and an equally long tail at the other. Just think of Fred Flintstone's pet Dino. One of the newly discovered species, Scylla Titan sinensis, would have been about 20 metres long, while the other, named Hammy Titan jingjangsensis, would have been 17 metres in length. The findings, published in the journal Scientific Reports, suggest both animals lived during the early Cretaceous period between 130 and 120 million years ago. To once again quote the immortal Dr. Sheldon Cooper, there is absolutely no scientific evidence supporting clairvoyance of any kind, which means that fortune-telling is a fraud, the profession is a swindle, and its livelihood is dependent on the gullibility of stupid people. But of course, none of that stops people from actually visiting psychics, or for that matter, psychics from preying on those true believers. A couple of New York psychics who scammed more than $700,000 from their victims ended up getting nothing more than five years probation and in order to pay back just a small portion of the money they had scammed off. Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptic says, It all goes to show that if you're a psychic in New York State, crime really does pay. It does, unfortunately. And it's a big uh, industry, especially in the US. It's billions of dollars worth of uh, business in the US is, is the psychic business. Occasionally, and nowhere near often enough, psychics are taken to court because of schemes that they've used to get money out of their clients. And we're talking lots of money in some cases. It might be just bad advice or because they just see someone coming and they want them to keep coming, etc. Or it could be because... Because in particular cases, they claim the client is under a curse and that for a fee, they will remove that curse. Now, this happened in Manhattan and it was a couple of psychics who, between them, were charged with fraud, grand larceny and a range of other things. They stole more than a million dollars from their clients, which is pretty impressive. But the trouble is, when the court finally got to them, they... Both got five years probation, so they weren't put in jail, and they were ordered to repay their victims a portion of what they stole. Like, for instance, one of the clients paid over $740,000 and they had to pay back $200,000. So in other words, they kept half a million dollars and they didn't go to jail. And you sort of wonder, really? If I stole half a million dollars from a bank, I'd go to jail. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. That's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favourite podcast download provider and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Space Time store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, 
access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more Space Time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Space Time YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. And Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 